joined us. Welcome to QBiologics webinar. What's so different about QB Echo? QBiologics' new treatment for Crohn's disease is unlike any other biologic. We'll be looking at the immune dis system disruption behind Crohn's disease and hear from our lead scientists about how QB Echo SSI aims to restore the body's healthy immune function. First, a bit of housekeeping. Everyone, except the presenters and the organizer, will be muted during the webinar. This will help eliminate background noise and audio feedback in interference. Questions can be sent via live chat. The chat can be opened by clicking on the chat vignette, that's the conversation bubble, on the top of your screen. We will aim to answer all of your questions after the presentation is finished. A reminder to people who are phoning in from a telephone line, Please also sign into your computer or tablet if you want to follow along with the visual presentation. If you can't hear the speaker, see the slides, use the chat, or you get completely dis disconnected, don't panic. The presentation will be recorded and made public on our website under resources. Our web address is qibd.com, spelled Q-U-I-B-D.com. You'll also be able to find other resources listed there. Don't forget to like us on Facebook, QIBD, and follow us on Twitter, at Q Crohn's Trial. And now, the reason you're all here. Today's presenters are Dr. Sharin Kalyan, Director of Scientific Innovation at Q Biologic, and Dr. Mark Bazet, Director of Preclinical and Translational Research. Dr. Sharin Kalyan is a translational immunologist and leads Q Scientific Innovation. She earned her doctorate in experimental medicine and is a faculty member in the Department of Medicine with the University of British Columbia. Dr. Callian has been studying the pathophysiology of disease rooted in immune dysfunction and metabolic disturbances for over 18 years. She was awarded the prestigious Humboldt Fellowship to conduct research in Germany to investigate how commonly used drugs affect the immune function in people and to harness the healing potential of the innate immune system for immunotherapy. Dr. Mark Bazette is the director of Q Biologics preclinical and translational research team, where he leads the in-house preclinical science, plus manages external collaborations with Q's network of academic and industry partners. Dr. Bazette is a mucosal immunologist who completed his doctoral training at McGill University and has studied a wide range of gastrointestinal and respiratory diseases. Dr. Bazette joined Q two and a half years ago and has been instrumental in furthering the understanding of how SSIs work. Welcome, Dr. Kalyan and Dr. Bazette. To start things off, Dr. Shirin Kalyan. Thanks for the introduction, Bonnie, and thanks for everyone for your time and your interest in learning more about QB Echo and this new immunotherapy we're trying to develop which we hope will transform the way inflammatory bowel diseases are treated. So I'll start with a roadmap of what the presentation will include. We'll start off with a brief background on what the immune system is and explore its relationship with the, with the immune system and inflammatory bowel disease in particular, and how IBD is currently treated. We'll explore the current drugs that are currently used in the standard of care and how they're supposed to work. And I think this will give everyone a really good background or framework to understand how QB Echo is fundamentally different. We'll share with you some of the evidence we have gathered from our experimental data as well as from our clinical trials. And we're leaving a lot of time later on to answer any questions you may have and um, provide further information about the study that we're currently uh, taking place here to understand how QB Echo treatment results in um, mucosal healing. So to start off with, when we think of the immune system, most people think of its role in uh, the, the defense against infectious diseases, and that is its pivotal role. But the immune system is more than just immune defense. It has two arms. The first is the innate immune system, which is the first line of therapy. It's the first line of therapy, and it's, respons it's responsible for dealing with uh, the, the infectious and non-infectious stress through evolutionarily conserved patterns. 
And it, so it's able to recognize trouble when it sees it immediately. On the other hand, the adaptive immune system takes a little bit longer to kick in, and it works more like a lock and key. It's important for defending against new and emerging pathogens. And together, the innate and the adaptive immune systems regulate the health of our microbiome. And as we've all heard, the microbiome plays a pivotal role in regulating a number of health effects, such as metabolism, our mood, and even the shininess of our skin. So keeping a healthy microbiome is a pivotal role of the immune system. But further to that, the immune system plays a major role in making sure that our tissues are also healthy. It allows for wound healing to take place and for preventing and eradicating cancer. So with that in mind, when we think of inflammatory bowel disease, sorry, when we think of inflammatory bowel disease, it's interesting that the immune system is often regarded as being the problem. And when we look at the current treatments, which we'll walk through, uh, it's usually trying to suppress the function of the immune system. The gastrointestinal tract is actually one of the most complicated and sophisticated immune organs of our body. And within the gastrointestinal tract is the epithelial barrier, which is the most ancient part of the innate immune system. And it has a big job. Its job is to protect the host from the most intensely populated microbial habitat on Earth, which resides in the intestinal lumen. This is the contents of our gut. Now, what happens in IVD, it appears that there's encroachment of this barrier function. And we get uh, an, an invasion of this barrier, and which leads to the chronic inflammation. So your immune system is trying to deal with the invading pathogens that are present in the gut. And it's not so much that it's attacking itself. It's more that it's trying to do its job in protecting the host. So we have collateral damage, if you think about it, when neutrophils come in and inflammatory T cells come in to try to deal with this invasion of the gastrointestinal tract. As to why this occurs, it's, it's not exactly known, but we know that there is a genetic component to it. So uh, in the last few years, there's been a lot of work that's been uh, done to uncover the genetic variants that are related to these diseases in both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Some of them overlap, and some of them are unique to either Crohn's or UC. It seems in Crohn's disease, there is a systemic effect on the innate immune system, whereas in UC, you have a more local response um, effect of those genes. But what is important to keep in mind, many people in the general population carry variants of these genes. They're not defective genes by any means, but they're different versions of the gene. And so these, these variants do not actually predict disease. People without, um, that do not have IBD can have, have these versions of these genes, so, and that's important to keep in mind. And that has led to the uh, study of environmental triggers that may predispose to the development of IBD. And here are the four main components that have been looked at. There's been a lot of attention paid on diet, as well as the burden of stress, and lifestyle factors like smoking, which affect the resiliency of the immune system. And together, they lead to an, a dysregulated immune response that affects the microbiome. A large amount of attention has been played to the concept of a popular idea called the hygiene hypothesis in that we are not really stimulated to the same extent that we were previously with acute infection and that the sterility is what actually uh, leads to a, an atrophied or a less resilient immune system. If you think of it like a muscle that's not used very well, it's, it's the, the immune system is similar to that, that if you don't use it, you could potentially lose it and you don't have the same amount of a resiliency to extra stress. So how is IBD currently treated? So the, what has been the current standard is that there is a step-up method um, where we use um, aggressively more um, immunosuppressive strategies. This is changing now. We, we currently, what the strategy is that you try to dampen <coughs> initially the, the, the flare, the inflammatory flare with steroids and then you step up because you cannot stay on steroids for a long period of time, and eventually move up to biologics. 
The first biologic that had been used for this uh, for IBD is TNF alpha inhibitors. But what we found this has not really changed the progression of the disease, and most patients still uh, require surgery to deal with IBD. So when we take a closer look at what these drugs are trying to do, steroids are very potent immune suppressors. Um, this figure is busy, but it's essentially saying that there are multiple different ways that steroids uh, affect immune function that knock it down immediately. So it, it does provide very rapid relief to inflammation. However, it's not meant to be used long-term. And we know now that long-term high-dose steroid use should be avoided because it leads to toxicity, including infections, diabetes, weight gain, osteoporosis, poor wound healing, cataracts, and the list goes on. So the idea is that you want to get that pain under control, you want to get the inflammation under control, but you cannot stay on steroids or become reliant on steroids for a long period of time. The next uh, drugs that have been uh, popularly used in IBD are the teopurines. Uh, this includes the 6-MPs and ASA, and they're very potent immunosuppressors as well. They were initially used for cancer therapy, and they work by inhibiting your cells to make new cells, by blocking the ability of your genetic material to be replicated. And this leads to bone marrow suppression. The bone marrow is the place where most of your, of your immune cells are produced. So, and it's the place in the, in the adult body where most of the most rapidly dividing cells are present. And so if you use um, an immunosuppressive such as theopurines, one of the side effects is um, the inability to really deal with further infections because you've knocked out the immune system. Common side effects include liver toxicity, fatigue, hair loss, anorexia, and serious side effects could include easy bruising and bloody stools, as well as cancer. This particular class of drug was discovered through a chemical weapons programs in the, in the U.S., so it's, it's not playing around. It's pretty serious business. Another commonly used drug is methotrexate, it's, it functions ultimately, at the end of the day, very similar to theopurines. It's, a, it's an enzyme, it blocks an enzyme called dihydrofolate reductase, and folate is vitamin B9, which we know is important for growth. So again, it's, it leads to this, the same kind of side effects, the bone marrow suppression. And uh, folate supplementation can reduce some of these side effects. And now that's why, given the, the, the sort of hammer approach of some of these other immunosuppressives, that when biologics enter the market, it seemed to be a bit more of a relief because they're much more targeted. They're not just systemically blocking immune function, but they're targeting certain aspects of it, at least the first biologics that have been used. And there's a bit of a confusion when the word biologic is used in IBD. Uh, because the first generation of biologics used for IBD were uh, antibodies against specific immune molecules, it became associated with an immunosuppressive therapy. But in reality, biologics are anything that are from a natural source. It could be human, animal, or microorganism. And this contrasts to most uh, conventional drugs, if you will, which are chemically synthesized and their structure is well-defined and fairly simple. Biologics are complex mixtures, and they include a wide range of products, everything from vaccines to blood co components um, to antibodies as well as gene therapy. And QB Echo, in this regard, is considered a, a biologic. But it works very differently from the biologics that are currently used for the treatment of IBD. So uh, TNF, for example, uh, is a molecule called tumor necrosis factor that is secreted by your immune cells. So Antibodies that block TNF block its ability to do its job. And what TNF normally do, does is it induces fever, inflammation. It helps to remove damaged and infected cells and the growth of cancer. And it also inhibits the ability of viruses to replicate. So if you're blocking the affection of TNF for a long period of time, you, it, there is a risk of uh, serious infections as well as certain cancers. Mendeluzumab, also known uh, by its brand name Entivio, it works by a completely different mechanism of action. It does not block a secreted immune factor. It blocks a particular molecule that's expressed on epithelial cells. And this, it, this molecule stays attached, and its job is really 
to be a sticky thing that uh, activated immune cells that are rolling by can get attached to so they can be pulled into the tissue to fight any kind of problem or infection that's within the tissue. So it acts more like a break and, and a, a rope to pull in immune cells that are passing by. And so the side effects of vedaluzumab is, is much more um, constrained in, in that respect. It's much more localized, and it includes upper respiratory infections and uh, joint pain and, and headaches, but it's not as widespread as uh, blocking TNF. And uh, the last uh, biologic that is currently being approved for Crohn's disease, it was very recently approved in 2016, is Stellara, uh, which is an antibody against another secreted uh, molecule or molecules, IL-12, interleukin-12, and interleukin-23. And these are, again, immune cells uh, that function to activate inflammatory T cells as well as natural killer cells. These cells are important for fighting cancers and viral infections. So again, uh, long-term use of this drug can put one at risk of infections and certain cancers. Um, common side effects include fatigue and headache and upper respiratory infections. So when Q came in and is developing a new treatment for inflammatory bowel disease, um, it didn't come in with the intention of treating the symptoms, the inflammation. We're hoping that we can work more upstream and try to see if we can uh, tackle the problem uh, that's present in inflammatory bowel disease. And we've developed a platform of immunotherapies called site-specific immunomodulators that we're hoping will train the immune system to rebuild its defenses in specific tissue sites. And it uses the fact that acute infection is the best exercise or um, stimulant, if you will, for the immune system to really optimize its function and its resiliency. And, Mark, and now Mark will tell you a little bit more about SSIs. Uh, thank you, everybody, and thank you, Sharon, for giving that great overview of current treatments. So I'm going to really focus on how uh, SSIs work and then specifically how QB Echo uh, leads to uh, resolution of symptoms in uh, Crohn's disease. I'm going to primarily uh, look at preclinical models. So these are animal models. I'm going to pass it back over to Sharon, who's going to talk about some of the clinical work that, that we've done. So what are site-specific immunomodulators and how do they work? So site-specific immunomodulators are bacterial-derived uh, immunostimulants. So what we do is we take some specific bacteria and we inactivate it, and then we process it and use it as our uh, immunostimulant. Now, these bacteria are completely inactive, so there is no ability to, they don't, they're not alive, they cannot give you any infection or anything like that. We then administer them every second day by subcutaneous injection. And the real goal of this is to create an organ-specific activation of your innate immune cells. And what we mean by this is we use a pathogen that is specific to the different organs to create an organ-specific response. In this case, we use QB Echo, which is an E. coli-based product, for the stimulation of the gut or to recruit and activate and create appropriate innate immune responses in the gut. We also have other products that we're not going to focus on today for the lungs and the skin. So a uh, lung pathogen, Klebsiella, for the, for the lungs and a skin pathogen, Staphylococcus aureus, for the skin. Now, you're probably a little bit confused because I just said activate about eight times, and um, we know that Crohn's disease and, and IBD is an overactivation of the immune response. So how does using SSIs, these products that are designed to create an acute immune-like response, actually lead to, to resolution? And it's really that you're creating the appropriate immune response or the correct immune response in the organ that leads to resolution. So Sharin talked about your adaptive immune responses and your innate immune responses. We're activating your innate immune response to clear up pathogens in the gut, to rebuild your barrier function, to start causing those healing cycles that lead to symptom resolution. 
which is very different than the current treatment strategies, which try to just block your symptoms and hope everything gets better. We're really treating those underlying causes by re-stimulating and creating an appropriate immune response, really getting your body to heal itself is, is the ultimate goal. Of course, how do we actually show this? So in, um, in drug development and to, to develop any drug, you generally start in experimental models. And we've primarily used uh, animal models for this. So I'm going to show some of the initial animal model that we've done using uh, mouse models, both at Q Biologics and with a number of our collaborators across, uh, across Canada and the United States. So we have two different ways that we can test uh, IBD in animal models. The first is what we call the MUC2 mouse. And this is a mouse that doesn't have the mucus linings in their gut. So the bacteria are able to see the, the intestinal wall and start doing that translocation that uh, Shirin was talking about earlier. And they develop a model that's very similar to what uh, a patient would get. We can also do some chemical induction of these uh, mice to give them what looks like colitis. So the first question really is, if you treat a mouse that has a colitis-like phenotype or looks like they have colitis, do we, get, uh, do we get an improvement in symptoms? So, and um, I'm going to show you over here. This is the, the placebo mice here, and you're going to all know histopathology by the end of this. Um, Placebo-treated mice have a gut that's completely inflamed, is falling apart, where once you treat the mice with QB echo, you get these kind of tree-like structures. That means there's healing going on, and that's what appropriate, uh, an appropriate gut looks like. So these are tiny little gut slides we're looking at under a microscope. And really what you're seeing is an improvement in the number of cells that are going into the gut, which we call infiltration, an improvement in the integrity, which is your epithelial lining. So you're really rebuilding your gut um, when you use our product, and that's what these mouse models are showing. But how does this actually work? Uh, so what we do is we create activation of certain immune responses, which leads to an overall clearing of symptoms. So here we're looking at something called IL-18. IL-18 is a cytokine that is produced when you get bacterial responses. So when, you're ba when your body sees a bacterial, it produces IL-18, and like our product, the bacterial product, we would expect if you treat with uh, QB echo, you'd see an increase in these, these uh, IL-18 molecules. So you can see when you give a mouse placebo, um, you get an increase when you give them QB echo in IL-18. So we're creating an appropriate immune response in the gut to start fighting the, the bacteria that are in the actual tissue and the surrounding area. But does this lead to symptom relief? And it does. So we've looked at a number of different components. So the first are what are called CD3 lymphocytes. So lymphocytes are part of the cells that go into the gut and cause that chronic disease that leads to IBD. And you can see here, when you have um, mice that are treated placebo, they have a huge number of these T cells or these lymphocytes in the tissue that's decreased when you give our product. So it's a reduction of, of certain parts of the immune response. So we stimulate the innate immune response to lead to a reduction of these lymphocytes, which leads to symptomatic clearing. Neutrophils are another part of the immune response that are highly elevated in IBD. And once again, when you give QB echo, what you're doing is you're leading to a clearance of these neutrophils compared to placebo in the mice models. So really what we're doing is we're clearing out those, um, the, the, bad or the bad inflammation by re-stimulating an appropriate immune response. And you can see a number of different markers down here. We use something called GCSF and CXCL1. These are two markers. These are two what are called cytokines that call the neutrophils. They're basically big waving uh, immune markers that tell everything to go to the gut, and we're reducing that to prevent the, the neutrophils from actually going into the gut tissue. 
So right at the beginning of the talk, Sharin talked about how you've got your adaptive immune response, your innate immune response, and one of their big things they do is regulate what's called the microbiome. So that's all the bacteria in your gut. And to have a healthy gut bacteria leads to a healthy person. You, you are, are what your bacteria is sometimes. So we also asked, well, do we change the bacteria in the gut for, for good? And we do have some evidence that we create a more positive gut microbiome in, in these animal models. So when we look at a bacteria called lactobacillus. Now, lactobacillus is probably one of the best bacteria out there. When you hear the word probiotics, it often is a lactobacillus. When you eat uh, yogurt, it's full of lactobacillus. It's what makes yogurt. So it's a good bacteria to have in your gut, and it leads to uh, a positive gut environment. When you see here in red, this is a mouse that has been treated with QB echo compared to the blue here. In the lactobacillus, you're getting a large increase in the amount of lactobacillus in your gut. So you're shifting towards a positive bacteria or a bacteria that's healthy for you or good for you. In reverse, when we look at a bacteria called the gamma proteobacteria, this is a group of bacteria which are generally bad for you. They include things like E. coli and, and other bacteria like that that generally are not healthy to have at a huge amount in your, uh, in your gut. So once again in red, you can see that we reduce these bad bacteria. So you need to increase the, the good bacteria and you need to decrease your bad bacteria. So that's what we believe that we're, we're doing. Um, so we're resetting the immune response, um, helping to get rid of the bad bacteria, uh, rebuild your microbiome, and, and really lead to ultimate um, symptom relief. So I have um, a different model that we've used just to, sh to show you one last picture of, of mice before we go talking about what happens in humans. In mice, we get, an, um, this is a, what's called the DSS model, and what you do here is you give the mice a chemically induced colitis. So it's a chemical modulation, and the mice get very, very sick, and we can treat this with QB echo. You can see here QB echo in blue, they have less symptoms than, uh, than the placebo mice. So um, we definitely have what's called proof of concept or proof of principle in um, mouse models that our product works. And then uh, a couple years ago, we moved forward into clinical trials, and we did some uh, larger clinical trials that Shrin is now going to talk about in some of the results in, uh, in that. Thank you, Mark. Oh, no, sorry, I've got, <laughs> my apologies, I have one, one more this slide is, that I entirely the missed. mice are not part of our clinical trial. Um, yeah, these are not a clinical trial, this is another mouse study. <laughs> one of the uh, big uh, things that can happen with patients when they, are, uh, when they have um, IBD is over time they have a higher incidence of colon cancer. So if you have IBD, a large number of patients will in, uh, inevitably get colon cancer. So we also looked at whether we would be able to treat this. Um, so we used a mouse model of colon cancer that is developed through similar mechanisms as it develops in patients, and we were able to see a reduction in the amount of tumor in the QB echo versus the placebo. Now we can go to the clinical data. Um, there you go, Sharon. Thank you very much. Thank you. I just realized I was using the pointer, which was not part of the program pointer. So I was pointing things along before, but you probably could not see it. So apologies for that. So uh, we've done a couple of phase two trials now, one in Crohn's disease, which was a randomized placebo-controlled trial in patients with moderate to severe Crohn's. And in that trial, we had assessed the change in the Crohn's disease activity index. The second trial we had looked at, which I will not be discussing, but we have data on that if, uh, if you want to see on our website. Um, sorry. Oh. The, uh, the second trial was an open-label study in moderate to severe ulcerative colitis in which we were assessing mucosal healing. It was a small trial, and we just presented the data th uh, of that particular trial at DDW, the, the dise uh, Digestive Diseases Week that just took place. And we have the poster up, I believe, up on our website, right, Bonnie? Will do. Okay. So in our, in our previous Crohn's disease trial, 
uh, we had 68 patients that were fully enrolled, and they were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to either receive placebo or QB echo for eight weeks. And subsequent to those eight weeks, those who were responders stayed on whatever blinded treatment they were on, and um, those who were non-responders were put on open-label QB echo for the subsequent eight weeks. So it was a 16-week trial in total. This is a busy slide, um, but hopefully you'll get the main gist of it. The red bars are, are showing the response to QB echo, and the blue uh, indicates those who are on placebo. And within the first eight weeks, you can see that those who were treated with QB echo experienced a, a much larger reduction in their Crohn's disease activity index. It's at the eight-week time, uh, we found that those who stayed blinded, those people who were on QB echo initially and stayed blinded on treatment, actually did uh, improve further to week 16. And that was the overall trend. It was interesting, the placebo non-responders who were subsequently put on QB echo had a very similar trajectory. They also experienced the same degree of um, reduction in their symptoms as those patients who were originally uh, uh, randomized to receive QB echo. Of note, the placebo responders um, at eight weeks, when they stayed blinded on placebo and continued their treatment, they actually lost response by week 16, which is actually uh, a, we took as a good indicator of the biological effect of QB echo, and which prompted us to further the development of this and, and, and move forward with our second trial, in which we really want to look at objectively mucosal healing rates. What was really intriguing was that in both the CD and UC trials, there was a specific immune signature that we found that corresponded to those people who were responders. So the blue line here indicates uh, the, the change in these immune markers in their blood that increased in people who were able to respond productively to treatment, whereas those who did not respond actually had no change in these immune parameters and we'll be inve investigating in this current trial that we're in, in which we're enrolling to see if we can actually use this as a predictor of response to QB echo, which would enable us to actually personalize treatment for inflammatory bowel disease for the first time, and, and which is really exciting for us. We'll be doing this by taking a small sample of blood, and we'll be stimulating it ex vivo, so in a Petri dish, essentially, with, our, with QB echo, and we'll be able to see whether or not they, they produce these cytokines and whether the ability to produce these cytokines in a Petri dish really means that they'll be able to respond well to this treatment. As far as safety, so far, so good. Um, in our animal toxicology, there have been no significant red flags that have come up. Uh, we have treated a number of patients uh, in our compassionate use program and there have been no real serious adverse events at attributed to SSI therapy in over 254 cancer patients as well as 16 patients with IBD. In our clinical trials as well as our compassionate use program, the thing that pops up the most and which is sort of expected from what we know as to be the mechanism of action is that there is a mild transient flu-like symptoms which really indicates that your immune system is kicking in and trying to clear that uh, in infection in the gut. So it, it's anticipated that when your immune system is awakened with, a, with an immune stimulant such as QB echo, that you will experience certain flu-like symptoms and that may actually be a sign that things are working accordingly. And we hope to follow up uh, in looking at the safety in the patients as, as our trials get bigger. So now we are, we'll be happy to take your questions and really thank you for listening and your time. Here's the information if you want to learn more about our trial. It's, it's called the RESTORE study. Um, if you want to see whether or not you're eligible, you can go to our website, www.restoretrial.ca, and there there will be a, a, a survey questionnaire. You can also directly email cdtrial at Q, qibd.com. And, and indicate your interest. And now we will be able to answer any questions that may have popped up during our presentation. Thank you. Now's the time you can send in your questions via chat. If you have questions which you'd like directed to either of our experts, 
please indicate them and uh, type, the, type the question in and we'll try and answer as many of them as we can. Okay, so the first question is, how many, how many participa participants remain in remission following the last trial? So I, maybe I'll answer that. <laughs> um, the, we followed the participants in the last Crohn's disease study for eight weeks after stopping therapy, and the majority of patients that had, had, had gone into remission at the end of the treatment period stayed in remission at the end of the eight weeks. We have not followed the patients up subsequent to those eight weeks, though. Yeah, so we're open for any other questions that um, you may have with regard to the information that both Mark and Sharon had presented um, in, in outlining the, the science behind the, the QB Echo clinical trials and the QB Echo clinical development program that we have. So maybe I actually have one question. So with this, we, we asked clinical trial participants to be involved with the clinical trial, but we also collect some biological samples from them. How does that help you understand how their immune system might be working? That's an ex excellent question. Yeah, I'll, I, I will start and sure, and you can talk about your assay at the end. So we, we look at a number of different aspects in the clinical trials, um, and this is what's called the translational research, where we really want to try to understand how patients respond to, to the products not just, um, it's to really to make the product better in the future, whether it's to determine which patients are more likely to respond so we can have personalized medicine, but also to further understand how our product works um, so we can make it better, safer, more efficacious. So a couple of the aspects that we have in the next trial that we'll be looking at, one is called cytokines. Cytokines are the, uh, the big markers of uh, inflammation and the immune response. And we're really going to be seeing what is the immune response to our product in these cytokines. We're also looking at the microbiome. So we collect uh, microbiome samples. And we're going to be able to see how much we change the, uh, the microbiome of the gut and, and in what way do we change it. So those are just two aspects of some of the, the exploratory analysis or some of the translational research that we include into these kind of trials to really get the most understanding of how these products work to, to really further the development and to, to select the best populations going forward. Sharon, maybe I'll pass it to you to talk about your stimulation assay. I think that's, that's super interesting also. Yep, and just to add to that list, we're also, as I mentioned, there is a genetic association with, with IBD, and we will be exploring uh, whether or not there there is a, a genetic background that is more responsive to QB echo treatment. An extension of that is there's an, a new field uh, that's looking at the reprogramming of the innate immune system, and we're actually looking at the regulation of your genetics. It's called epigenetics, and we'll be investigating um, aspects of how, you, how QB echo may actually be changing the programming of the innate immune system with this kind of stimulation. It's, we consider it sort of, as I mentioned, sterility is, and the hygiene hypothesis led to sort of a lazy type of immune system that is unable to deal with the challenges that it faces. And whether or not at this time, previously it was thought you can't really reprogram the immune system, that this is sort of set when you're early, you need to be exposed to these pathogens when you're young. But we're wondering whether or not this approach can actually help reprogram the immune system to have a better ability to deal with the challenges it faces, the, the additional stress. So we'll be looking at, at those aspects as well. As Mark mentioned, um, and I had mentioned when I was going through the clinical work, that we'll be looking at um, stimulating your immune system or cells from your immune system in vitro. So we'll be taking a small blood sample and we'll be exposing it to um, QB echo, and we'll be defining the immune profile of those, and we'll be able to then follow and match that immune profile to ultimately how the patient responds to treatment over time and, and how that associates with mucosal healing. Excellent. Well, thank you. 
Next question is, if someone has been on one of the current biologics, could they switch to QB Echo? Uh, does that mean for the trial? For the trial, yes. Yeah, let's, let's assume that it's within the trial. Okay, yes. Yes, uh, most certainly uh, people who have been treated um, or are being treated with biologics, but there is a washout period. You need to be free of um, exposure to uh, any other biologic for three months. Uh, two months. Two months. Days. Oh, 60, 60 days. days. Sorry. Next question was, in the last webinar, uh, there were two individuals who presented their experience from a previous clinical trial, uh, both of which relapsed um, into the, had Crohn's uh, symptoms and mucosal proof of disease present um, after completing the, their participation. Do you anticipate better results after longer treatment? And are there any other uh, any others that have come forward with better results uh, in from the last study? Yes. So what we found is um, because we're, we're not it's not sort of suppressing the symptoms that it does take a little bit longer to make sure that the immune system is is being reset, if you will. And when when we're treating a disease that way, a little bit upstream of the symptoms. Um, it does seem to take longer. So our last trial was 18, uh, eight weeks, and we recognized that people continue to improve with a longer term of treatment. Up to 16 weeks, they were still improving. For our current trial, um, it has two stages. The first stage will have 20 patients in which we'll really be dissecting the amount of time needed to achieve mucosal healing. So we will be checking two time points, 16 weeks and week 26 to determine when is the best time um, to say that QB echo has an effect to actually change the, the mucosal healing or your gastrointestinal inflammation at, at the mucosal layer. So we're, we're anticipating and at least hoping, uh, and we've invested in it, to, to, to look at how QB echo, um, how long people should be to, to uh, be treated with QB echo. Excellent. Next question is, if all disease is located in the small intestine with no disease present in the large intestine and therefore not visible to endoscopy, can I participate in the trial? So the answer is possibly. Uh, you may be eligible. There are criteria set for both the amount of symptoms that are required. Again, we're looking for patients that actually have active disease, so there's amount of symptoms that would be required. And then on endoscopy, there'll be a minimum amount of disease that is required. So that is something that um, the investigator would be able to follow up with you and, and um, be able to talk to you about. It is possible that you would be eligible, though, even with only small intestine disease. All right. Well, as uh, we seem to have run out of questions, we would like to thank everybody and thank Mark and Sharin. So I'll turn it back over to Bonnie to uh, conclude our, um, to conclude the webinar for today. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us for QBiologic's webinar about QB Echo SSI for Crohn's disease and why it's unlike any other biologic. We really appreciate your great questions. A special thank you to our experts, Sharin and Mark, for joining us today. You can always find more information by going to our website, qibd.com. That's qibd.com. That's where a link to, the, to a recording of this webinar will be posted next week. If you'd like to sign up to participate in our current trial of QB Echo for Crohn's disease, your first step should be to complete our online pre-screening questionnaire at www.restoretrial.ca. After that, our clinical trial recruitment nurse, Andrea Cameron, will be able to start guiding you through the clinical trial process. And if you are a likely candidate, refer you to a trial site. Remember to follow us on social media. Like us on Facebook, QIBD. Follow us on Twitter, at QCrohn's Trial. Thanks for joining us today, and stay tuned for upcoming news and events.